Hi, y'all, and welcome to tonight's live stream. This is one of the ones where I sit here waiting to hit the button because I cannot wait to talk to you about what happened today. Charlie Adelson managed to offend half the jury, and he didn't even testify. We are going to talk about all of that. Happy Halloween to everybody. For those of you who aren't from the U.S., it's sort of a strange not really holiday, but festivity where kids go around and ask for candy. But we have had absolutely zero candy trick-or-treaters today. I don't know what the deal is, but the HLL house has not yet had any. So if we hear a doorbell, I'll be really excited. And dad is all ready to go on giving them out. I have learned over the years to only buy candy that I really don't like because a lot of times there's a bunch left over. I'm sure people will put in the chat that they have the same experience. Okay, so today, Charlie Adelson insulting half the jury. And you are not going to like it either. I just say, knowing you, knowing this crowd. But yes, I'm going to make you wait until the end to find out what he did. Because that's about when it came in the, in the, in the proceedings of things. Now, um. Please be sure to hit the subscribe button. We're covering this trial, the Dan Markell murder trial, the trial of Charlie Adelson, his ex-brother-in-law who was accused of murdering him. We're covering that all this week. Here you go. Super quick graph it. Dan Markell was murdered. His ex-wife was Wendy Adelson. Her brother, Charlie, is on trial right now. Donna and Harvey are their parents. And three people have been convicted, Katie Madbanawa, who was both Charlie's girlfriend and at times Sigfrido Garcia's girlfriend, and Rivera. Garcia and Rivera were the hitmen. So we are, I, I, my account will go up until maybe about four o'clock today. I'm getting closer and closer to the whole day, catching out from the day before. And, but so... If Wendy burst in at 4.15, demanded that she be allowed to confess, if they brought in Donna for an arraignment, I missed it. Please don't put that in the chat. I Don't ruin the surprise for me, and I'll still have that to look forward to. So a couple of quick, interesting notes about procedures and things that happened in the courtroom today. One was that apparently a juror complained about people in the courtroom in the gallery, not people in front of the bar, not the attorneys, but that people were apparently nodding or gesturing in a way that sort of suggested what they believed about the testimony. And the judge went back and admonished them and then went up on the bench and said, he, please do not nod or gesture in a way that suggests, in a way that may affect the jurors. That's what he said. A cell phone also went off and he had the person escorted out. It appeared that it was very unfortunately Dan Markell's mother, but she was allowed to come back in. But the judge was strict about is saying no more cell phones. So I'll give you a quick ending from Monday with Mary Hull, the forensic accountant. I got part of what she talked about yesterday. I wanted to throw in an extra thing or two. She went over all of the money that the Adelsons had and combined it, which is sort of a little unusual, but the argument being that they conspired together to hire hitmen, I guess that's part of why, that altogether the Adelsons had $8 million in various accounts, not including cash. Wendy being the poor relation at just 500000 They also the witness pointed out, gave incentives to people to pay cash for their dental work, which apparently is a thing. And they had a lot of cash. In fact, they called it piles of cash. You could just, they talked about moving money from our pile of cash to your pile of cash. And you could just kind of picture it piled up like fall leaves or something, people diving into it. So next was Sergeant Corey Hale, who was asked about Jeffrey Lacoste and that statement Jeffrey Lacoste had made about there being a celebration dinner about a month after Dan Markell was murdered. The prosecution wants to say this was celebrating the fact that Dan Markell had been eliminated, that he was out of the way, that now at long last, Wendy and her two kids could move to South Florida to be near the grandparents, Donna and Harvey, and their 
their uncle, Charlie, that they would all be together now. And it was a celebration of that. Wendy adamantly denied that that was the case. The defense, the person who talked about this was Jeffrey Lacoste, Wendy's mostly kind of headed toward off again boyfriend at that time. And he said, he is the one who mentioned this celebration dinner. Lacoste said on, in his testimony in this case that he didn't tell law enforcement about this because he was scared. He said specifically that uh, this witness said that, but this, this witness said, yes, he did tell us about that, which then led to cross. Well, so if he got up here and told us on the stand that he didn't tell you that, was he just wrong, lying, whatever, et cetera. So um, let me do a quick check. I forgot to look and check and make sure it's all the sound okay. Marlon us usually gives me a thumbs up. I don't see it, so we're going to assume it's okay. I did see a question. Is this only about yesterday? No. It's going to be mostly about, to about today's testimony. So I'm just doing, I had a couple of hours at the end. I hadn't done, so I'm doing a quick summary of that before I move to this current today and what happened today. In fact, I'm about finished. So Katie was known on Facebook as Katie Cash. I found that interesting too. We are going to get a transcript of that really hard to understand Dolce Vita discussion between Charlie and Katie Medbanoa. That is part of what the, st what the state contends really proves that they knew that there was a conspiracy between them. We're going to... and we actually get a transcript, not just a recording, which is good because it was really, really hard to understand that recording. And they've enhanced it. They've done various things. And now we're actually going to introduce a, have introduced a transcript. Okay. So moving to Christopher Corbett, Sergeant Tallahassee Police Department. He went through a little discussion of how they caught everybody, which isn't too important for us here since for the most part, that's already been Ha that's already happened. And there are people who are already in jail for that. 37 seconds. Um, there was on, you know, one thing that was really interesting, the way that they caught everybody was one single intemperate phone call from Sigfrido Garcia to, of all people, Harvey Adelson. And it was that one phone call that led to every, the downfall, the finding of everybody involved, because they managed to take that one phone call and connect Sigfrido Garcia to Harvey Adelson. And then the puzzle pieces started to fit in once they connected the Adelson family to the person. And they were able to follow that person and see that he, in fact, had gone up to Tallahassee. He, in fact, had been able to conspire and had conspired and had gone and murdered Dan Markell. So, and one of the things that was they talked about was the there were two different trips to Tallahassee. The first one, initially they had planned to murder Dan Markell, but it didn't happen. They went again in July to murder Dan Markell. And Charlie was texting during this period on his way up. He, um, Charlie was texting Magmanua as they went to rent the car. And she was actually present at the, let me make sure I got the date right. June's, yeah. Oh, sorry. The June car. When they rented the June car, Katie Medvana was in the area. They were able to put her cell phone in the area where the rental car was actually rented, connecting her to the rental car. And then she was calling Charlie Adelson on her way home from getting the rental car that the hitmen took up to Tallahassee. Then in July, there was another car rented, and that car was rented. Um, and but this time under Luis Rivera, the other hitman's name. So the conspirators did at one point I thought it was super interesting. The state said, What what about these conspirators? And put a graphic up, and the graphic for the first time eliminated everybody. Um, well, everybody except, um, well, I mean, I'm saying it wrong, eliminated Wendy and eliminated Harvey, but left Donna on and left Charlie on. And I thought that was really interesting. I wondered if perhaps the state was saying that intentionally or whether I had just missed it when they showed the other graphics about the communications. Wendy's count, Wendy 
deleted a couple of things during her discussion right before she gave her phone to law enforcement at some point during the day. One was a calendar entry for getting her TV fixed that day. I did think it was strange. Why would she delete that? Because according to the state, that's her alibi. And that was part of what they were doing to give her a reason to be at home and to not be anywhere near the murder. I didn't understand why that would be something she would delete, but that was something she did delete. They showed a great graphic. Let me show this to you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So this graphic showed how far out of her way Wendy Adelson went in order to go to the liquor store she went to to buy that bullet bourbon. Now, the dotted line would have been if Wendy had gone a way to buy a, to a liquor store and then to the restaurant where she was going to have lunch. Instead, she went to a liquor store very near where Dan Markell lived. And when, in fact, she said up to the street, saw that there was crime scene tape, turned around and left. Her vehicle was spotted that day. The state believes she was visiting the scene to see whether or not there had actually been the execution of Dan Markell as she wanted. That's what the state thinks happens. Happen. And you can see from this graphic that the purple line indicates where she went when she went to the liquor store she chose to go to that was near Dan Markell's house. And she could have gone to one much closer. That would have been the dotted line. In the end, it wasn't as much of a difference as you might think. I think the state said the dotted line would take about 11 minutes to drive and the purple would take about 20 minutes. So it wasn't as if she drove to South Florida and back, but it was still somewhat of a difference. Now, when, did, let's see, what else? <laughs> Sorry, lost my place now that I pulled that out. So, McBanawa, this is on July 18th. Now, this is the actual day of the murder of Dan Markell. He died the next morning on the 19th. McBanawa ended communication with Sigfrido Garcia, her on again, her boyfriend at times, father of her children, and dropped her. This is after the murder of Dan Markell or after he's been shot. He's not yet, uh, has not yet died. She drops her kids off at a babysitter's and goes to the area of, of she goes to be with Charlie Adelson and stays with him all that night. A huge point that the defense made, uh, sorry, that the prosecution made was that Donna Adelson arrived, that she came by Charlie's house. Now, the state says the reason Donna Adelson came by the house was to drop off cash because Charlie was to give cash to Katie McBanawa, who would then pass the cash along, keeping part of it, and pass it on to both Sigfrido Garcia and also Luis Rivera, the two hitmen. She was going to pay them. She was the conduit to reach them. And so Donna Adelson stopped by the house. She was legitimately on her way up to see Wendy. She was um, from South Florida up to where Wendy was in Tallahassee and drove by near where Charlie's house was. But the state said, and let me show you the, let me show you the text that she sent. Donna Adelson said, call us ASAP outside your house. And Charlie said he wasn't home yet, 10 more minutes to get home. Now, at that point, Katie Medbanawa wasn't there either. But this, the cross was, well, she first of all, the cross was that outside your house might have meant just along the interstate near your house, not literally outside your home waiting for you. And secondly, the but the state said, well, look, even though it's possible that she didn't have a lot of time because she was on her way and we can tell, the state admits, when she got to North Florida, to Tallahassee, we can tell that. But still, the fact that she was, that she could have just stopped by and dropped cash off, that could have happened too. So this, to the state, suggests that Donna Adelson had the ability to be right there at Charlie's house to drop off cash. They believe that she did actually do that. Now let's move on to the next that I want to show you. So, but the step, but the argument from the defense, from sorry, from the state was that the entire theory of the defense is that Katie Medbanawa was extorting Charlie Adelson. She was blackmailing him, that she leading or at least 
being maybe being led by unclear exactly who is in charge, but Sigfrido Garcia and Luis Rivera killed Dan Markell with the purpose of extorting or blackmailing the Adelsons. That's what they wanted to do because they figured if they could get Charlie Adelson upset enough that, or maybe worried perhaps that he would be implicated, he would pay them money and they would be able to get an ongoing payment from him because of, of, what they had done, killing Dan Markell. That's Charlie Adelson's defense. The state says, look at, y'all are getting along fine. It isn't like this happens here. This set of text messages is just a few days later. It isn't as if Charlie seems really angry, like he doesn't want to communicate. Instead, instead there's communication that's positive and nice. I do want you to look at this one, though. I did read this a little differently than the state. I, I mean, maybe, I don't know. Kat, Catherine McMahon was not really dating Charlie right now, but she says she wants Charlie to have a prescription called in for her because her scalp is irritated and she wants this kind of shampoo. My thought was, first of all, what woman who's recently dated and still may be interested in a guy is going to say, hey, give me a prescription for my irritated scalp? I, I don't know. I question that. And I want you to look at this next message, too. She says, no, it's OK. I feel better. I just suffer from bad migraines. It just sucks. And he says, don't forget to text Jerry your info. He will call it in for you in the morning. Sweet dreams. And I wondered, hmm, is this really a shampoo that's being called in? It sounded a little different for me. Give me your thoughts in, in the um, chat, if you would. I am kind of curious whether that seemed a little sketchy to you, too. All right, just a second. Let me pull back into my notes so that I can keep talking to you. Now, there were uh, these nice messages and nice communications, the state said, went on for a substantial amount of time. They clearly, the state believed, were friends. They weren't enemies. Charlie didn't seem to be threatened or like he was being extorted. The defense made some comments like that suggested they might argue otherwise, that maybe he was just trying to butter her up, be really nice, so that she would be less hostile, less threatening to him. And the state, the defense says that she actually threatened Charlie and his family and his extended family, not just Charlie, but his um, parents, his sister. And that was why he was paying money to Katie Medbanawa and she was funneling it then to Siegfriedo and Luis Rivera, or at least to Siegfriedo. Luis Rivera, it appears, was really not cut in on the knowledge that all of this was going on. Now, there was new data in the presentation since, uh, since the... <laughs> I'm saying that wrong too. There was no new data in the presentation that the witness gave since the arrests were made in 2016. And that's a point that the defense has hit pretty hard on cross-examination. So look, in 2016, you had every bit of information that you just provided to the jury. There was nothing that you got later. And yet you didn't charge Charlie until 2022. What took so long? Why did you wait? And there was a question. So you, somebody didn't think it was enough to charge Charlie, did they? Objection. And then it, it got dropped from there. But that is clearly what the defense is saying. The defense is saying you, you didn't believe the amount of information you presently have was enough to charge Charlie. So why is it suddenly enough now? Now, they talked about renting the car and the Madbana was phone being with it yesterday when she testified, I guess it'd be two days ago now, she said that she was not at the rental car location. Gave the defense another thing to say, well, so if she told us yesterday that she was at the, that she was not at the rental car location, you have proof otherwise. You can see from what the cell phone data shows that in fact she was there when the vehicle was rented in June. They, there was a lot of talk about the birthday present to the to the father. Let me make sure I can get my right messages to you. I'm going to go ahead and pull this up so I can get it to the correct spot for you. 
So, and here, I'll go ahead and show you these. Um, these are some continued messages. This is October continued messages between Katie Midmanawa and Charlie Adelson that seem positive. He says, I love you. It makes me feel good that you care about me. I'm very lucky to have you as a part of my life. And the state says, does it sound like somebody's extorting him? Or does it sound like they're still friends? Like maybe they had worked together, not opposed to each other. Katie says in February of 2015, see, I always know how to make you smile. Yes, you do. Katie says, good, I love you. I love you too. All of these statements really do make it seem like, and okay, that's where I will break because now I'm going to be talking about Donna Adelson and Charlie Adelson and their communications about Wendy because we got a lot of really important information about Charlie Adelson and what he thought about Wendy. And we're going to get some more than that. But I, let me make sure I have not left anything out. Oh, I'll go ahead and start right there. Okay, so the state said that Charlie and his mom were meddling. They called it meddling in Wendy's life. And that this, this meddling was something that covered her personal life. It covered her finances. It covered pretty much everything about her. And this is... <laughs> You're really going to get into this. I think you're going to like this. So let's take a look. This In this, this first set of slides, the state is saying that Donna, the mother, Charlie, the brother, were meddling in Wendy's financial life. She had put down a deposit or at least signed a contract in order to purchase a home in Tallahassee. They didn't want her to do that. And then, so this is all the way in 2013. She's divorced, but she's not... Dan Markell is still alive. And Wendy, here's what they wrote about that. Charlie Adelson is upset when he hears that Wendy was going to be buying this house. She never told me. Why is she doing this? She never mentions it to me on the phone. I guess it's because it's stupid. Did Danny give her permission to move schools? And then later, Charlie says, spoke to Wendy for 20 minutes last night. She texted me today that she pulled the plug on the house. And Donna writes, wow, Charlie, thank you again. How did you accomplish that? You are a miracle worker. Tell us. And Charlie writes back and says, it took about 15 minutes of talking to her. I basically told her owning a house is like getting married. Renting is like dating. Why the F would you want to get married again? And so his art this was something that the state said showed that there was this constant oversight. There was micromanagement that they felt like they were kind of in charge of Wendy's life and she wasn't able to make decisions on her own. That's how I interpreted it anyway. Now on February 15th, the, again, um, this is before the murder of Dan Markell, but in the midst of the heated battle over this divorce and over the, specifically the custody issues related to the two um, to the children. And Donna writes to Charlie because in opening, we learn that Charlie's side is going to say he wasn't really all that involved in any of this, that um, he, this was some, Wendy testified to that too. He wasn't involved in Wendy's divorce. Yes. Her mother was overprotective. Yes. Her mother might've been sort of meddling, but Charlie, no. Not so much. So, but here's Donna writing to Charlie about the divorce. Wendy's totally stressed out. Yesterday was a rough one. She will probably have to go through another depot. Outrageous. Her attorney will claim he is abusing the justice system by filing repetitive motions on issues that have been resolved previously. Did I say his attorney? Her attorney. And oh, by the way, the half million dollar account is the same 50000 that he tried to get his hands on last time, but it was always in Wendy's name. And then Charlie asks, is Wendy mad at her attorney yet? And Donna says, yes, but don't get Jet worked up about it. She's too stressed about it. Let's just keep conversation with her light and not add to what she's dealing with. Let her just get through Monday with positive family support nothing stressful. Trust me on this. So they were busy talking about the divorce. It wasn't as if Charlie didn't know some of the problems. 
And on February 19th, Donna wrote Charlie and said, if you speak to Wendy today, tread lightly. Don't ask questions about the depot, her lawyer, et cetera. Tough time, and she's really stressed out. The A showed up at soccer yesterday, and when she tried to leave with the boys, he said, no, stay here and play with Abba. She told the boys that Abba had to leave, and he said, no, I don't. Of course, she woke up to another email from him telling her that she is lying to the boys about their father's whereabouts and that this will be brought before the court. Such a bad word. It was Wendy's day. He is allowed to attend the children's activity, but that's where it ends. So Donna and Charlie were both clearly communicating about what was going on in, in her divorce. So, but it went further than just that because they talked about meddling in Wendy's love life and specifically talked about a boyfriend she had, Dave Attell, I believe it was. And throughout this section, it was almost impossible. I'm going to go ahead and pull that out so I can see y'all better. <laughs> see y'all better. I guess it doesn't really work that way. You can see me better. Um, so this was apparently her boyfriend at the time of the wiretap in 2016. But, and Dave, according to the testimony of the officer who was test, testifying by this time, came up at least a dozen times and they played some phone calls. Frankly, I could not understand the majority of what they were saying, but there was part I could understand clearly. And here it is. Now, I, <laughs> this, y'all are going to go, nuts on this part. You are going to go totally nuts on this. So go ahead, fingers poised over your keyboard for your, for your chat or your comment, or if you're on your phone, get your thumbs ready because you are definitely going to want to comment on this. Now, Charlie was discussing with his mother the love life or lack thereof, in their opinion, of Wendy. And it sounded like maybe Dave had proposed and Wendy was going to turn him down or thinking about turning him down. That's what I gathered, although it was super hard to hear. This part was not. He referred to older women as like a car with high mileage. He said, which would you rather have? A car with high mileage or a car with low mileage? He was basically saying that no one would be interested in Wendy because not only did she have kids, which was horrendous, but she was ancient and a clearly a car with high mileage. He said that even if a, a Victoria's Secret model was, was interested in him age 37 with kids, he would not be interested. No one decent, no one you would want to marry would be interested in a 37 year old with kids, even if she was a Victoria's Secrets model. So as far as dating someone he's um, of that age, he said, hell no. His mother and, and talked about the fact that it won't do you any good mom, Donna, to talk, to try to talk to Wendy about this. Cause you'll only get 30 seconds into your planned speech before Wendy tell, tells you just to butt out of her life, to leave her alone. So I am, the, the thing about, oh, let me, one additional point before I, before I talk to you about your opinions, my opinions about this. She, he also said, most people don't ever get an opportunity like this to begin with, which I think might have referred to Wendy's once in a lifetime lottery ticket chance to marry Dave, but I wasn't sure. And Charlie said, as much as you feel like punching her, or sorry, knocking her over the head, I feel like punching her and then knocking her over the head. <laughs> it's like, wow. So I really cannot wait until I get some of your opinions on this. I'm going to skip down here because dang. And also, I just want you to think about how much this matters because half of the jury is female. As I understood it, of the 15 jurors, 
seven were female, eight were male. Of those, pretty much all of them are going to be over the age of 30, which would more or less fit with what he's suggesting is over the hill and highly undesirable for anyone who would be worthy of being married to. So th they wouldn't fit in that. And he's more or less said, half of you are like not even worthy of being married. No one decent would have you. So we don't know of those seven, how many are actually on the jury? Because remember, there are 12 jurors and three alternates. So it could be that three of the women are all alternates. More likely it would be a mix. Nonetheless, really bad look. And it definitely matters. It de people will notice this. People on the jury will have said, hmm, interesting attitude. It also does something very favorable for Wendy because it suggests that she was very separated from her mom and Charlie were working together, but she wasn't really listening to them. She wasn't really doing what they wanted her to do, which suggests uh, helps her with the claim that she isn't involved in whatever they did. And of course, she doesn't believe her parents or her brother were involved in the murder of Dan Markell. At least that's how she's testified. But it does help her look better, makes it look more like, okay, Wendy maybe, maybe wasn't involved because there was such clearly a division and she wasn't listening to them or paying attention to them. So maybe maybe she really didn't have anything to do with it. And that may explain partly why the state has not arrested or charged her, or for that matter, Donna. The state also talked about meddling in Wendy's career, and Charlie took full credit for having convinced Wendy to take the job she had and said she can't comprehend how lucky she is, which I think again referred to the vaunted Dave, who was really desirable apparently, and did say at least she doesn't see herself as the victim anymore. Somebody wrote, I was in the live stream that I was watching, somebody wrote, I can't imagine why Wendy would want to move back home. <laughs> I laughed because I was thinking, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking too. So, I, oh, oh, I see a good comment um, of uh, Sharon saying, even men could be disgusted by Charlie's pitiful attitude toward women. Yes, jurors have moms and sisters and mother-in-laws. I agree. I think it was very serious. There was one other incident where he laughed at a period of the trial when they were reading comments by his mother about Dan Markell, the decena, the person murdered. And he started trying to keep from laughing. I'm going to do a little video on that. I've been meaning to do it so you can take a look at what happened. But I thought at the time, does that matter? Yeah. Yeah, that absolutely matters. I guarantee you somebody on the jury was looking at him when he did that because somebody on the jury is looking at him at every moment because that's why they're there, right? To evaluate whether or not he's guilty or not guilty. What are they going to decide? And so they're going to they're going to be watching him throughout. Will every single person on the jury have seen it? No, but will somebody have seen it? Yes. I think that there will be people who've seen it. So I am looking forward to reading some of your comments when we go back because I figure I'm going to get some really funny comments. <laughs> I was truly amazed that he said that. He didn't know, of course, it was a wiretap. He had no clue that he was being recorded. I'm sure he would be, you know, dusted off, brushed up out in public. He wouldn't say things like that. But this is what he said behind closed doors on the wiretap. Those were the actual words that he was saying. And presumably how he really felt and how, and I do think that will have an impact. I think it was painful for the Charlie Adelson side when that came out. I want to say just a, a little bit about the bump. I've had some questions about that. And I think tomorrow we'll cover the bump and the Dolce Vita video and we'll talk the transcript. We'll talk about that and what it means just to answer the general question, what is the bump? What happened there? Uh, and I can show you a picture. This There was an undercover FBI agent who approached Donna Adelson on the street. And here he is. It's all recorded and 
actually, there was a film of it. He approached her, handed her that piece of paper. Now, the piece of paper was an article about Dan Markell's murder and had a number, $5,000, and a phone number written on this sheet of paper on this article. So the he didn't say anything other than he said, we know you've taken care of Katie and you've taken care of Siegfrieda and you need to take care of my friend. Made some comments like that, but didn't say anything more than that. Didn't say that this had was not clear at all about what it was that he was saying she needed to pay for. The prosecution says, the law enforcement said, what they the reason they wanted to do this was they had by this time, oh, good grief, did I know? <laughs> I, I looked at the pictures. They were really helpful, but I forgot to show them to you. Okay, there's Donna, and here's Donna again. That was the further out. You can see him handing her the piece of paper, and you can see him talking to Donald Adelson. She was on her way to pick up the kids. So what law enforcement said was, by this time, it had been, oops, didn't mean to hit that, <laughs> hit it again. Okay, here we go. So by this time, it had been two years since the murder. So all of the conspirators weren't necessarily talking about it anymore. So they needed to do something that would sort of prompt everybody to get involved talking about this again. And so what they would do is they would pass this to Donna and see what happened. They said they had noticed before that there would be conversation from Donna to Charlie. He would talk to Katie. She would talk to Sigfrido and, Lu and Louis Rivera. And it went along a chain like that. Or if they had to communicate the other way, it went backwards along that same chain. And so they said they wanted to see would it happen again. Is that the same way it would work this time? And they concluded that, yes, that is exactly how it works this time. But tomorrow we'll cover the conversations between Donna and and Charlie that followed this. Um, I'll give you just a little preview so you can take a look. So, and sorry for the fuzzy. Oh, not fuzzy for you. You aren't even seeing it. Okay, here we, here we go. One of the things Charlie said was, does Wendy know that? Does it involve Wendy or anything? Donna was being very, very cryptic on the phone with Charlie. And notice how Donna says six times, no, 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 no. So, oh, it's only five. The last one is a so. I'm sorry, I can't count that one. But said that really clearly. She said, let me just talk to you later. And they go on, does it involve me or other people, says Charlie. Donna, well, probably both of us. I'll give you just a little more to tantalize you. Donna says, probably the two of us. So you probably have a general idea what I'm talking about. And Charlie says, all right. So that that is what we're going to get into tomorrow. You definitely want to hit the subscribe button because you do not want to miss hearing more about what goes on with that. Now, let me do a quick look through for uh, questions. See, do I have any? Because I don't want to miss out on a question. Oh, and if you would, please be sure to put question marks at the beginning. I have a lot better chance of seeing it. So let me, whew, going all the way back up to the top, a lot of comments. I'm glad though, because I really can't wait to read what you had to say, especially about that. Okay, so I'm going to flip down to the bottom now and look for the questions and see what you wrote for your questions. I I just cannot wait to go back through and read what y'all thought about what Charlie said. So those aged Victoria's Secret models who are just not going to cut it. Uh, oh, someone asking about explaining what the bump means. The bump is that transaction where there was an undercover agent pretending to, oh, he was pretending to be a member of the Latin Kings, which was the gang that Luis Rivera was a part of. He was pretending to sort of represent Lewis and say, hey, we want payments from you. We're going to extort you. We want, we know what you did and we're going to blackmail you. We want more payments. 
the biggest Charlie's biggest concern seemed to be that they would keep going. It would be one thing if they just wanted 5,000 and they go away, no problem. But if what they want is ongoing payments, well, then that's a problem. Now, Charlie did say over and over, we may need to go to the police. And that's something they are going to argue very hard is that that is exactly why it is that Charlie that Charlie was not involved, that Charlie had nothing to do with it. The fact that he would even suggest they go to police shows that he wasn't doing that. Okay, let's keep going. I'm going, I'm looking for questions. I'm looking for the questions. Do y'all not have any questions? That is astonishing to me. <laughs> well, all right. I don't see, oh wait, here's one. Why wasn't Donna charged? Well, that is a very interesting question. And that reminds me, I want to show you this. Let's see if I can possibly find it fast enough. But this is something that there that came from law and crime. And I wanted to know what you thought about this because I was really surprised. Here it is. Here is law and crime's description of this case. This is the fourth and final trial in the 2014 murder case. Interesting, because the state has said repeatedly that they believe Donna was a conspirator and they've suggested that they believe Wendy was a conspirator. I've seen less certainty around Harvey. I don't know exactly what the state thinks about that, about how involved he was, but definitely the state thinks that the, that the mother was involved, Donna. And so why hasn't she been charged yet? I think the answer is just that she hasn't been charged yet. I was just curious if any of y'all had noticed that and what you thought about court about law and crime saying it's a final trial. I'm not sure it is. I'm not at all sure that it's a final trial. I think they may well try to charge Donna. I do think that if they don't get a conviction for Charlie, I don't think they would charge any of the other Adelsons. If they get a conviction, though, that opens up the door for them to charge Donna and maybe potentially Wendy. That's going to be harder. They have definitely, she has some very different things happening in factually than what Donna and Charlie do. So G-Man is wanting to know, will Charlie take the stand? And Sharon is asking me that too. I don't know. I don't know. Wondering that. I'm thinking no. I, I'm thinking that because they seem to be trying to get in the facts they want through other witnesses, which is, you know, of course, natural, of course, what they would want. But I I'm thinking that they won't do that, but we will wait and see. That is something that I think a lot of people would like to know. It would be fascinating if he did. Oh, here are lots more questions. My goodness, you did have a lot of questions. Okay, do you think Charlie will go free at last? Is there any probability for that? Sure, there's. it's possible. It's definitely possible that that could happen. I think that they waited a long time because... They wanted to make sure they had enough evidence, and I think they must have had at least some concerns that maybe they did not. I think they would have charged him six years ago, and they don't have a lot of additional evidence. So somebody made the call that I think that's what we had is enough, whereas somebody back then wasn't sure enough to move forward. So at this point, he is being charged. The, the truth is that convictions go, according to federal research from the uh, Pew Research, in federal cases, over 99% of trials result in a conviction for the defendant. So any time <laughs> that you want to predict, will he go free? Your prediction is probably going to be a nope, not going to go free. So that would be my prediction because it's safe. But I do think the defense has done a great job on cross-examination. I think their theory of the case is not exactly clear yet, and they have not made that theory reality yet. Will it take Charlie testifying to do that? I do not know. I am very curious. I have not seen Wendy in the courtroom. She may still be, after she first testified, she was kept under the rule of sequestration and was not to hear the testimony of anybody else because she might be called back. And I don't know if that happened after she testified the second time, if she's still under that rule, but she may not be able to be there. That may not be possible. Do you think Charlie, this is Tam saying, do you think Charlie, oh, I forgot to say who that was, Javon. Okay, Tam says, do you think Charlie has 
plausible deniability with his excuses for the relationship being on the rocks and she was extorting him. Well, I, again, I would say, Tam, that it's the chances that a defendant wins are very small. What are the chances he has here? I think they're doing a good job of bringing out the facts that they have. And then we will just have to see kind of where that takes things. What is the situation with the second brother? The second brother appears to char there was a second brother, but he appears to be completely uninvolved and, and very separate. The state simply used the fact that his relationship with his mother was fairly strained, apparently because the mother was very actively involved. At least the daughter-in-law felt like was actively involved in the marriage and therefore they sort of cut ties. And so there hasn't been a lot of communication. So I want to say um, thank you to Janet Stuttered uh, for the super chat. And she asked me, did they six years ago, did they Katie or Lewis? Hmm. Six years ago, maybe, did they Katie or Lewis? I am so sorry, Janet. I am not sure what you are asking me about. So uh, Katie and Lewis have both gone to jail, if that's what you were asking. They both have, as has Sigfrido. Katie is serving life sentence without parole. So is Sigfrido. Lewis got a lot less. He turned state's evidence, testified, pled guilty, and he got seven years on top of a sentence he already had to run concurrently. So it was a 19 year sentence, but only seven extra, if you will, because he was already being, uh, he had already been charged and was going to be spending time in jail on another matter. So that'll be it for tonight. Be sure to hit the like button and the subscribe button. Thank you to our moderators, and I will see y'all tomorrow night at 7.